And uh, up next we have uh, Professor Yitzit Atepi, and he's uh, a chemistry professor at Michigan State. Um, and his research is on the synthesis and use of natural products and their analogs for modulating proteasome activity. And today he's going to speak to us about therapeutic small molecule proteasome activation. Oh, thank you, Greg. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the organizer for giving me the opportunity to talk a little bit about the, uh, the research that we're doing in our lab. And uh, as uh, Dave Washburn already said, some of the cisplatin uh, royalties get used by the foundation to sponsor certain projects. Uh, the project I want to tell you about today is one of those projects that's been funded uh, in part by the MSU Foundation through the uh, Strategic Partnership uh, Grant. Um, the disease we're focusing on in our lab is multiple myeloma. And multiple myeloma is a cancer of differentiated B cells. It's therefore primarily found in the, uh, the bone marrow and the, where the multiple myeloma cells really feed on the microenvironment of um, uh, the bone marrow. Um, as we see here in the slide, if, if this is a multiple myeloma cell, uh, there are several pathways that are over uh, expressed or constitutively expressed in multiple myeloma cells. One of the pathways that drives growth and proliferation is the NF kappa B signaling pathway. Uh, this pathway is activated by certain cytokines in which IL-6 is one of the primary cytokines that activate this pathway. What you see in a bone marrow environment is that the multiple myeloma cells uh, have activated NF-kappa B, which then induces the, um, the uh, transcription of IL-6. So these cytokines, in part, then go on and activate bone marrow stromal cells, which also, again, then activates the NF-kappa B signaling pathway in the stromal cells. Once NF-kappa B is activated here, it again, it induces a wide range of cytokines, IL-6 being one of the primary cytokines again, uh, as well as rank L, which is the um, receptor activator for the NF-kappa B ligands. Those will activate the osteoclast, and the osteoclast, once they get activated, they actually start to um, decompose the, or destruct um, the, um, the bone density in your, in your skeleton. The osteoclast, again, you activate this NF-kappa B pathway, which induces IL-6, which then induces NF-kappa B again at your multiple myeloma cells. So what you see here is in this cycle, this vicious cycle in your bone marrow environment, you have these multiple myeloma cells uh, activated uh, NF-kappa B inducing growth uh, and proliferation uh, as well as survival uh, of the multiple myeloma cell itself. And at the same time, the osteoclast will start to degrade your bone density. So you get this combination of tumor growth and degradation of bone density, which is obviously a very bad combination. About 30,000 uh, patients are uh, diagnosed per year in the U.S. Uh, the current survival is a little bit under 50% uh, in a, of a five-year survival. Uh, the standard treatment uh, as of 2003 has been proteasome inhibition by primarily bortezomib. There's two new drugs on the market I'll talk about a little bit uh, that are currently taken over the market from bortezomib, but it's really the, the, the standard frontline therapy for multiple myeloma. The biggest problem in this uh, disorder or this disease is that after about five years, almost all patients become resistant to treatment, and after that, there's really no follow-up treatment. Bortezomib itself will inhibit the degradation of this in, um, uh, I-kappa B, this in, uh, inhibitory protein for NF-kappa B. Bortezomib blocks the proteasome, and therefore NF-kappa B cannot be activated, cannot induce uh, gene transcription of these cytokines. So you really, in effect, block that signaling pathway of NF-kappa B, and you block the growth of the multiple myeloma. And as a side effect, you actually also prevent the degradation of your bone density. If you look in more detail about the, uh, the way uh, bortezomib works, it targets the proteasome, which is shown back here. The proteasome itself is this um, very large barrel-type structure. Inside of this barrel, you have catalog sites shown back here, the beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. Those are proteolog sites. So the proteasome will degrade proteins, such as I kappa B, uh, at these catalog sites inside of the barrel. You have these, uh, the barrels shown back here, you have this alpha ring that is uh, the top ring of the proteasome, and that has a gate that controls the gate opening that provides an access to those proteolog sites inside of the proteasome itself. Typically, this gate is closed, and so proteins cannot be de uh, degraded by the proteasome unless these caps, this is another multifunctional, multi-subunit um, complex that will actually dock on top of the proteasome it has these small peptide change, these hydrophobic change that dock into small pockets on top of that alpha ring, and it will induce this ring opening 
to allow access to the gate and the catalog site. These caps will actually recognize the proteins that need to be degraded in the cell. So proteins will get ubiquitinated, and this uh, it gets induced by a variety of different uh, post-translational modifications that result in the ubiquitinylation of these proteins. Once a protein is ubiquitinylated, it's those caps that will recognize the ubiquitinylated proteins, and they will unfold the protein, as shown back here, push it down its barrel, and inside the barrel, the catalog sites will then degrade uh, these proteins. So bortasm structure is shown back here. Bortasm is a small peptide with an electrophilic head group. It's that head group that will actually covalently bind to those catalog sites and therefore block proteasome activity. So when a patient's treated with bortezomib, you block degradation of all proteins that need to be degraded in the cell. It's a very effective way of inducing cell growth, but as you can imagine, it's also a uh, relatively toxic um, treatment. There's currently two other drugs on the market, carfilzomib. It's much more uh, tolerated by the patient, and exazomib is really the same structure shown back here, but it's a prodrug and it's actually orally available, uh, so it's likely going to take over from uh, bortezomib. Again, as I said earlier, the biggest challenge right now is that all patients will become resistant eventually to bortezomib treatment. And since all these drugs operate through the exact same mechanism of action, there really is no follow-up treatment once a patient becomes uh, um, uh, resistant to bortezomib or any of these proteasome inhibitors. So what we wanted to do is uh, try to find new molecules that would block that vicious cycle of nf kappa b mediated um, uh, tumor growth as well as bone destruction. So what we did is we looked at a variety of different natural products. These are marine sponge metabolites that in the literature were found to either in inhibit cytokine production or look like molecules that inhibited NF-kappa B. This was our starting point to find out, to try to discover new types of proteasome or new types of NF-kappa B inhibitors. In, um, so we, the, the group itself synthesized a variety of these molecules, and we're still working on some of these molecules in our lab. But instead of also just generating these or synthesizing these molecules, one of the strategies we had was to make small molecules that kind of resemble these types of natural products. Instead of making a complex natural product, if I can make a small scaffold that looks like some of these natural products, as shown back here, I should have access to a small molecule in a short amount of time, and I should be able to optimize it very quickly uh, for its properties. So many of the students over the year have developed new reactions to access these small type of scaffolds that in fact resemble then these natural products. Once we've made the molecules, we then test them in a luciferase assay. So for this, we used a, uh, a cell that um, has a, a plasma that expresses luciferase. Luciferase is probably something everyone has seen before. It's the same enzyme that's present in fireflies. So what happens if we treat cells with a cytokine such as IL-16 or TNF-alpha, we activate this NF-kappa B signaling pathway. NF-kappa B becomes activated, translocates into the nucleus, binds to the DNA, and in this case expresses this protein called luciferase. Once luciferase is expressed, it will transfer uh, luciferin into oxyluciferin, and it will give off light, and we can actually measure NF-kappa B activity by the light that comes off the cells. If we then treat the cells with the different types of molecules, if we see a decrease in the activity of luciferase activity, we know that somewhere along this pathway, we affect this NF-kappa B signaling pathway. This is the molecule imidazoline uh, that we've been focusing on a lot over the years. And what we see is that that molecule blocks that uh, signaling pathway uh, relatively effectively. Here's the structure shown back here. It's TCH13. Uh, if we treat these cells with uh, dose uh, uh, various doses of TCH13, uh, we see an inhibition of that NF-kappa B luciferase activity with an IC50 of around 1.6 uh, micromolars. We subsequently did a whole bunch of other studies um, and until we got to uh, taking blood samples from not patients but healthy volunteers that gave us blood, and we then activated the blood with a cytokine to activate the NF-kappa B signaling pathway, and then we measured cytokines such as IL-6 or TNF-alpha to see if we actually, in a more complicated system, blocked the, uh, the NF-kappa B signaling pathway. And you can see here that we have very reasonable uh, IC50s uh, when we expose them to TCH13. So at that point, we knew we affected the NF-kappa B signaling pathway. We could block cytokine production through NF-kappa B. 
and uh, we start to look more in exactly where in this pathway of NF kappa B activation did we block um, or was our target. As we've seen here in this, uh, this picture, uh, cytokines will induce multiple uh, post-translational modifications to I kappa B. And I kappa B is the inhibitory protein that sequesters NF kappa B in the cytoplasm. Only when you have these um, post-translational modifications occurring on I kappa B, uh, including ubiquitinylation, it gets targeted by the proteasome for degradation. The proteasome will subsequently degrade or uh, eat up the I kappa B protein, therefore liberating NF kappa B, which then induces its gene expression. So in one of the assays, what we found, if we look at just I kappa B, um, we can stain that with fluorescent antibodies shown back here. So all the red that you see here in the cells, I kappa B. If you then treat it with a cytokine such as TNF alpha, within about 10 to 20 minutes, you see all the I kappa B disappearing, meaning it's being degraded by the proteasome. If you then add in TCA13, uh, you can block that degradation by that cytokine. So what we found here in the assay and a variety of other assays that we described uh, more in, in this paper is that these molecules block the degradation of I kappa B. And so that led us further to the proteasome, which is responsible for the degradation of that inhibitory protein. As we started to look for the proteasome as a possible target, we found something very interesting. If you look at the proteasome itself, it has these three catalog sites. There are probes that bind specifically covalently to these three catalog sites. And these probes are shown back here. This is a molecule that has an electrophilic site back here. So these catalog um, sites, the threonine in that site, will actually attack that position, and you covalently bind that probe to the catalog site. On the other end of this probe, you have a biotin moiety, so you can stain the um, uh, the protein for an antibody for that, and you can actually visualize the, uh, the catalog site as shown back here. So if you take the proteasome itself and you run it down a gel um, and you expose it to this, to this probe, you can see the beta 2, the beta 1, and the beta 5 catalog site now covalently bound to that probe. However, what we found is when we treated the proteasome first with our molecule, we saw, still saw that this probe very effectively still bound to that same catalog site. However, if you treat something like bortezomib, we see that we covalently block that site from binding. So what we saw here was that our molecule did affect the proteasome and did prevent a degradation of I kappa B, but really did not interact at all with these catalog sites of the proteasome. And that was something very new uh, at the time when we first discovered that. So we didn't know what the mechanism was. We knew it affected the proteasome. We just did not see any of the traditional ways of uh, inhibiting the proteasome through an interaction with the catalog sites. Um, this mechanism uh, translated very well in both in cell culture as well as in vivo uh, studies. Here we see a range of um, leukemia and multiple myeloma cells. We effectively killed them, um, and we had some good selectivity for uh, the bone marrow stromal cells or the normal cells that we tested um, against these compounds. But I think more importantly, if you look at resistant cell lines, so this is a THP1 cell line with different levels of resistance to bortezomib, the current uh, leading drug, you see that you go from an 8 nanomolar inhibitor to a micromolar inhibitor there. So those, those cell lines are uh, very uh, resistant to bortezomib. If you treat those cell lines with our molecule, even though we don't have the potency what bortezomib has, we see that we're completely overcoming that resistance to bortezomib, which again would imply that the mechanism of inhibition is very different than what we see with traditional proteasome inhibitors. Um, we then subsequently treated uh, mice that have multiple myeloma uh, tumors with a uh, large dose of uh, TCH13. This was done by IP injection. Uh, here you have the tumor growing over time and both bortezomib and a molecule very effectively block the tumor um, from growing. Um, so at that point, we started to look at a wide range of different uh, imidazlines, see if we can optimize the activity, see if we can uh, make them a little bit more potent. And to do so, we've developed over the year a variety of different reactions. I won't go into the details of the, uh, the scope of these reactions, but we just needed to develop new reactions to access different types of imidazlin scaffolds. We are currently still working on uh, new reactions to make these types of imidazlines that, again, can access different functionalities that we cannot access with the current uh, method. Um, these molecules are then tested. Now that we know that the proteasome is a target uh, in an in vitro assay where we take the proteasome, 
we have a small peptide chain that is functionalized with a fluorescent probe. If the proteasome is active, it will digest or cleave this small peptide, and the release of the probe will indicate that we have an active proteasome. If you inhibit it, you would obviously inhibit the release of the probe and not see the uh, fluorescence. Uh, what we found with this molecule, TCH165, is that instead of inhibiting the proteasome, we actually saw that we activated the proteasome. And that is something that was very, very new. Um, there really have been no uh, proteasome activators reported as of recently. And what we see here is when we take the proteasome, we treat it with a molecule, we actually get a very strong increase in the proteolytic activity of the proteasome. So we can allosterically activate the proteasome. The, um, Double the concentration of the proteasome activity of each of the three catalog sites are, are shown back here. Um, we get about eight to ten-fold increase in proteasome activity. Um, this only worked for the 20S proteasome, and we don't see any effect on the 26S proteasome. And that is the one that's been assembled with these caps. So we wanted to look more into the mechanism of action of these molecules, and the person really that spearheaded these studies is, is Evert, who's in the audience today, too. I'm not sure where, where she's right there. So she did a lot of this work I'm going to be showing you next. Um, we worked also with another group uh, in University of Texas Health Science Center, Professor uh, Maria Kaczynska, who is using atomic force microscopy to actually look at the proteasome. And in atomic force microscopy, you can use a small a needle that actually taps over the surface of a, of a, a biological or a biological molecule, and you can actually outline the surface of whatever you're, you're investigating. Because of the size of the proteasome, it's a very large complex, you can actually do this on the proteasome itself. And so what we see here is an actual outline of the alpha ring, of the cap shown back here, of the proteasome. If you then treat the, uh, the proteasome with this molecule TCH165, you can start seeing that this gate actually opens up. So if you add in higher dose of molecule, higher dose of TCH165, uh, you see more particles with the open gate itself of the proteasome. Um, Corey Jones is not a graduate student in the lab who's doing a lot of modeling, and he really tried to find out what could possibly be the mechanism of this gate opening uh, of TCH165. And what I'm showing here is the results that he received when he docked TCH165 to the proteasome itself. And what he found was that these molecules dock in those small hydrophobic pockets in which the, uh, these caps of the 19S all actually dock into. So as shown back here, typically in the body, the 20S proteasome is in an equilibrium with the 26S proteasome. These caps will then dock these small peptide chains into the grooves on top of this alpha ring and therefore open up the gap. What he's seen is that TCH165 actually docks in those hydrophobic pockets. Uh, we can actually test this experimentally. We can make these small peptide chains and then do competition experiments. and so. When we look at the RPT chain, the small peptide C-terminal chain, um, we can actually see that in the presence of this chain, we will actually block the uh, TCH165 from activating the proteasome. So at this point, we think that this molecule blocks on the alpha ring and prevents uh, or blocks in one of those uh, openings and open up the, the gate of the proteasome itself. Um, Evert then tried to look at the, um, the assembly of the proteasome because if the small molecule would actually block on that alpha ring, the question was, does it actually affect the caps from docking onto the proteasome itself? And that's exactly what we're seeing here. So this is a Western blot where we look at the 26S proteasome. It's shown back here. And this is a double cap, and a single cap means you only have one of these caps on either the top or the bottom of the proteasome. Um, here's the cap itself, here's the 20S subunits, and these are additional controls showing that we have the same amount of uh, proteasome in each of our lanes. And so what we see, if we increase the dose of TCH165 in cells, that we actually get a disassembly of the proteasome where we end up with only the 19S caps and the 20S proteasomes by itself. So in terms of proteasome activation, we see that this molecule can actually activate the 20S core of the proteasome, and it will also drive this equilibrium to generating more of the free 20S proteasome. 
Now, why is this important? That's really, the, I think, the most important question. Um, all proteasome inhibitors thus far just reacted with the catalog site. If we can change this equilibrium from this form to the small form, we actually have a completely different cellular mechanism. What we see in cells themselves, um, this equilibrium is actually dictated by the cellular environment, meaning that if a cell is exposed to, for example, oxidative damage, um, this fully assembled complex will disassemble to form more of the 20 esque non assembled complex. And the reason for that is that this unassembled complex does not have these 19 S caps. It will therefore not be able to recognize ubiquitin related proteins. It cannot unfold proteins. But what these, this catalog unit can do is degrade proteins that are already are unfolded. And so these are what we call intrinsically disordered proteins. When a cell occurs oxidative stress, uh, proteins get oxidized, proteins get damaged, and they'll start to unfold, and therefore the proteasome will quickly disassemble to form more of the 20S proteasome to start degrading those unfolded proteins. Once unfolded proteins start to accumulate in cells, they start to aggregate and causing uh, neurotoxicity or other toxicity. So typically speaking, uh, these disordered proteins are only present in a very short amount of times if you can detect them at all. Because when a protein is not unfolded, it's typically immediately degraded by the 20S proteasome. A couple of examples of these unfolded or disordered proteins are shown back here. Uh, as I already said, oxidatively damaged proteins have a tendency to be unfolded. alpha nucleus is not a protein that's an unfolded or a disordered protein. Tau, SOD1, uh, beta amyloids, and I assume a lot of these are, are very well-known targets for neurodegenerative diseases, meaning that if these proteins accumulate, they start causing neurodegeneration. Um, other proteins more involved in cancer growth are ornithine decarboxylate, CFOS, and CMIC. Those are all proteins that are also uh, intrinsically disordered. What that means is when you have a cell and it starts to express, for example, a large amount of CMIC, it starts to have a lot of uh, it starts to transform the cells from a normal cell to a cancer cell. It starts to drive tumor growth, and um, it also has a major role in relapse of patients as well. Uh, same with CFOS. CFOS has also a very strong uh, effect on uh, when you start um, uh, overexpressing CFOS, you get enhanced uh, inflammatory responses and, um, and growth as well. So, Anytime these pathways are overexpressed in cells, we either have um, the cell will start to in induce uh, cancer or we'll start to have neurodegenerative diseases. We tried to test this to see if we actually, if these molecules will actually start to target those overexpressed disordered proteins. And what Eva did in the group is that she uh, fused a structured protein with the disordered proteins. If you now express this in a cell, if you uh, activate the 20S proteasome, you should selectively start to target your disordered proteins, and you should not affect your structured proteins. And therefore, you would have fragments of different size if you start activating the uh, um, 20S proteasome. And that's exactly what she saw. When you, run the, when you take cells and you treat them with uh, TCH165, um, you start having this large uh, fused complex over time being degraded to its smaller fragments. If you then treat it first with bortezomib, you would block that degradation. So this is one of the slides that shows that, you would, that we are selectively activating the 20S proteasome and selectively degrading only disordered proteins and not structured proteins. And we see here that we have a nice dose response as well. If you then look at other proteins such as uh, CFOS, CFOS is a protein that's involved in uh, cell proliferation, so a protein that's involved in uh, the formation of uh, AP1-induced um, cytokine production. Um, it's also a disordered protein, so when you now treat it with a molecule, you start to get a complete degradation of that protein in cell culture. If you block the proteasome, again, you would block that induction of degradation, so you therefore you don't see its, its mechanism at all. Um, we have no effect. GAP-DH is a structured protein, and we see we have no effect on, on structured proteins. So what it comes down to is this molecule will selectively induce one part of the proteasome and will start to target proteins that already are unfolded. This translates very well in cell culture. So if you look, for example, 
uh, in, uh, in a, a normal cell line, we have no uh, toxicity. If you look at a multimeloma cell line, we get IC50 of about 1.6 micromolars. Uh, this is a glioblastoma cell line. We have about two micromolars, IC50. Uh, the nice thing about this molecule, it's actually orally available. So when we take it into a mouse model, we see here there's a multimeloma mouse model. We see that the, the tumors are growing in the vehicle control. And we, again, we uh, block uh, tumor growth. Um, after uh, oral gavage of these mice with 100 micromolars uh, per meg, or per kilogram. Um, the exposure is very good, 1.4 micromolars. Again, that's the C-max that kind of matches the, uh, the IC50 we obtained in the cell line. Um, recently, we've also had um, the opportunity to work with our veterinary school, and so in the labs of uh, Vilma Yusbush Jan Gurken, what she did is she's focusing on Bernese mountain dogs. Now the reason that we're focusing on Bernese mountain dogs is that these dogs at the age of about, uh, this is a Bernese mountain dog right here, at the age of about seven years they start to get a disease that's a CFOS driven disease, uh, which again is a disordered protein. Um, and uh, there's really no treatment option for these, for these dogs. So after about seven years, if the dogs are being diagnosed, um, they actually have approximately 80 to 90 days left uh, to live. There's no treatment option. It's very aggressive cancer. Um, she tested our compound in a variety of um, histiocytic sarcoma cell lines and found that of the many compounds she's tested, many uh, chemotherapeutics she's tested, this was one of the only ones that were actually able to, uh, to kill these uh, histiocytic sarcoma cells. So we then pushed this forward um, and tried to match the efficacy uh, that we had, or at least the PK that we had in the mice, we treated the dogs uh, with 50 milligrams per kilogram of TCH 165 uh, to match approximately the same C, uh, C max as well as the area under the curve. It's about the same uh, at the 50 milligrams per kilogram uh, in beagles. Um, after we did that, we looked specifically at the toxicity of this approach. Uh, what we saw here is that um, by clinical observations or by body weight, or we did a complete uh, blood panel on the treated dogs, we saw that um, the blood count as well as the clinical chemistry showed no changes at all compared to the pretreated animals. So at this stage, we have uh, given the dose what we think based on the mice studies, an effective dose, um, but we see no uh, toxicity as, um, as of yet. Um, currently, we're scaling the molecule up to a larger scale. Unfortunately, these are very, very large dogs, so we need a lot of uh, material for them. I, I wish they were chihuahuas, but they're not. Um, so we're scaling this up, and uh, we're initiating a, a clinical trial at the MSU Vet School um, in this particular dog, um, which hopefully will, will start uh, at the end of October. Uh, with that, I would like to thank a lot of the students who obviously have been working on this over the years. A couple I want to point out to Terry Lansdell. She really did all the original work on TCH 13 uh, when she worked in the group. Uh, Adam Mosey is shown back here. He made TCH 165 for, uh, for the very first time. Uh, Eva did all the biological studies I've shown back here. Sorry, shown back here. Corey did all the modeling studies. Um, and then we have several other people still working on the synthesis of uh, more drug-like molecules, trying to still increase the potency uh, of these scaffolds. Um, I want to thank the NIH and also, again, the, the SPC, the uh, Strategic Partnership Grant that has funded some of this work uh, over the years. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Jetsa. Uh, do we have uh, one quick question for Yitza? And if not, we can uh, head off to the... Oh, there's one. So, um, what would you think would be the mechanism for the resistance for botalumid? So, um, that's a good, great question. Uh, in the cell lines I've showed you right here, it's because of mutations in the catalog sites. Um, in patients, uh, it's not sure what to resist, and yet it's a very heterogeneous tumor. Um, so it could be, I mean, it, it's a wide range. It's dependent on the microenvironment. It starts to upregulate some of the catalog sites, like the B5 subunit is overregulated or, or overproduced in cells of uh, some multimeloma patients. But there is not one specific uh, resistance mechanism. There's multiple different ones. 
Okay, let's thank Jetze again. So now we'll, we'll move on to a break. Uh, and it'll be a full 15 minute break. We're about 10 minutes behind right now, but we will take the full 15 minutes. So please uh, come back at 10 minutes after four o'clock. <laughs>